iRobot is a company called Foster Miller. And Foster Miller is interesting because just like it, it was launched by three MIT engineers. Now, um, Foster Miller is a fascinating company because iRobot started out in robotics and moved into the defense world. Foster Miller is a defense company that moved into the robotics world. And it's actually a subsidiary of Kinetic, which is also linked to, um, you know, the company that everybody loves to speculate about, the Carlyle Group. Say more about the Carlyle Group. Oh, and your, your listeners are probably more familiar with the Carlyle Group than I am. It's, you know, uh, uh, one of the large investment firms based in D.C. that has sort of a who's who of people on its board. Um, and it's the company that conspiracy theorists love to hate. Uh, P.W. Singer, you write about, in a previous book, Corporate Warriors, you write about mercenaries. Mm -hmm. Do you see a link between mercenaries and robots having to do with deniability, not being included in the body count? and other issues? That's a really great question. And, and a lot of people ask, you know, how do you, you know, how did you, you first did a book on private contractors, then a book on child soldiers, and now one on robots. You know, what's the thread that links these? And um, there's two. One is that the sands are shifting underneath us in warfare, and we're in denial about it. Um, we have an assumption of who fights wars, and it's usually a man in a uniform, and that means, oh, well, he's part of a military, and he must be fighting on behalf of a government, and it must be politics and patriotism. But look at, for example, the rise of the private military industry. That is someone who's fighting not on behalf of a government, but a private corporation. Profit motive is involved. Child soldiers, another breakdown. Ten percent of the combatants in the world today are children. You know, it, war is not an adult game anymore. And then with robotics, it's sort of the ultimate breakdown of humankind's 5,000-year-old monopoly on war. Um, but the second thing, as you raised, is, a, is an important point, that the use of contractors, as well as the movement towards um, machines, is in a sense a sort of outsourcing of responsibility and outsourcing of risk, trying to avoid some of the political costs that go to war. You know, I'm often asked, well, does this save us money? Well, that's not the right question on either the contractor issue nor the digital issue. We aren't using these systems because simply they save money. It's because they allow us to avoid certain political costs. Are these robotic technologies available to the mercenary companies like Blackwater? Um, yeah. Uh, there's a section in the book um, I call it Soldiers of Fortran, after the old software um, program Fortran. And there's a great story in it, which actually encapsulates some of the weird ways this is going, where um, a group of college students fundraised money to do something about Darfur. And they ended up actually raising about a half million dollars. It went well beyond their wildest dreams. And so then they explored whether they could hire their own private military company. And they were called, you know, sent messages out uh, via email. And a number of private military companies called them back to their dorm room. And um, one of them actually offered to lease them some drones and uh, to use in Darfur. And the, you know, g the kids are talking about this. They didn't imagine it would take off like this, but it did. Now, fortunately, some other people spoke with them and said, hey, this is really not the best use of the money that you fundraised. But it points to how these systems um, they're not just accessible to militaries. As you noted, they're being used by um, DHS, by police agencies, and, of course, many of them use commercial technology. You could, for $1,000, you could do it yourself. You can build the version of a Raven drone. And so— um, oh. Uh, well, it's a little more complex than we can go into on the show, but basically there's a do-it-yourself kit for building very similar to a Raven drone. And the point here is that you have— and the drone shoots people. Uh, that drone isn't armed. It's, a, um, it's the ability to sort of toss it in the air, and it could go off and a mile away show you what's on the other side of that hill. Now, of course, you could probably jury-rig it yourself to do bad things. And what I'm getting at is that just as software has gone open source, so has warfare. And these systems are not something that requires a massive industrial complex to build, like an aircraft carrier would or like an like a atomic weapon would. They use commercial technology. And so that means they can be used both for good and ill and by actors that have both good intent and bad intent. And the ethical question that we need to think about, you know, when we talk about robots and ethics, most people just want to talk about, you know, Asimov's laws. Well, we also need to think about the ethics of the people behind the robots. 
Well, let's talk about uh, specifically the experience of the soldiers who are now pushing buttons. They themselves, their lives are not at risk. They're not experiencing uh, the person at the other end. Yeah, when, when I use the term robots revolution, I need to be clear here, you know, I'm not talking about a revolution where, you know, your Roomba vacuum cleaner is going to sneak up and ambush you. We're talking about a revolution in the way wars are fought and who fights them. And this aspect of distance is one of the big ones. Um, it changes the very meaning of going to war. You know, my grandfather served in the um, Pacific Fleet in World War II. When he went to war, you know, he went to a place where danger took took place, and the family didn't know if he was ever coming back. And that's very different than the experience of, um, for example, a Predator drone pilot that I met with for it, who described that basically his experience of fighting in the Iraq War was getting in his Toyota Corolla, driving to work. He's doing this in Nevada. Driving into work, for 12 hours, he puts missiles on targets, then gets back in the Toyota commutes back home, and within 20 minutes, he's talking to his son at the dinner table. When you say puts missiles on targets, you mean bombs? Uh, hellfire missiles. You know, he's basically, he is, he is, engage, he attacks, he is mean. engaging in combat, um, <clears throat> but he's doing it from 7,000 miles away, and then at the end of the day, he goes to PTA meeting or takes his kid to soccer practice. And so it's a whole new experience of war, which is actually creating a new concept of a warrior. But you write, interestingly, that these soldiers who are engaging in war remotely actually suffer greater rates of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, it actually creates a huge um, psychological disconnect for them and challenges for them in a lot of different levels. And one of the people I met with was a commander of one of these squadrons, and he said it was actually tougher leading an unmanned squadron based back home than it was leading a squadron based in the Middle East um, deployed. And there's a couple things. One is the distancing. Um, you're at home, but you're watching these scenes of violence. You're watching both Americans die in front of you and not able to do anything about it, or you're engaging in kills on enemies and it's, you're seeing it. And then you leave the room and it's just like nothing else happened. Your wife is asking you about, you know, why didn't you were late for a PTA meeting. Um, you also have the fact that it, war is 24-7 now, and so you're at home, but um, your, your time schedule is off because of, you know, you're, it's 7,000 miles away. Um, there's a lot of psychological challenges that we're just trying to figure out. And there's also a little bit of denial in terms of the military support, because um, these guys don't want to seem like they're soft, and they don't want to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm suffering worse than the guys in the field. And uh, they're not, in many cases, getting as much support as they should be. What about the use of drones here at home, for example, on the border? Uh, it's a fascinating thing, because it raises this question of, um, who should be allowed to have these systems and how should they use them? So, for example, DHS saw all the success that the military was having with drones and said, you know, we want our own. Um, they bought them using mainly counterterrorism money, but of course, we know they're being used for a different kind of um, uh, infiltrator across the border than al Qaeda agents. They've been used to deal with immigrants and um, some drug smuggling. Are they armed? Uh, no, those ones are not armed. Um, but, you know, these are issues that you have to think about moving forward. Um, who should be allowed to have armed systems or not? Should police uh, be allowed to have it? You know, the L.A. Police Department is exploring purchasing a drone to put above a high-crime neighborhood and just have it fly above and document everything. Is that something we think is okay for our rights? What about, remember, drones aren't just big, large um, planes. Some of them are as small as um, they could fit on your fingertip, and they could climb up to a windowsill and peer inside. The relationship with games, uh, you write that uh, the best pilot is a 18-year-old uh, kid who uh, trained on an eight-box video game? Pretty much. It's a sort of fascinating story of— Xbox. Uh, yeah. He's, um, he was actually a high school dropout who— um, wanted to join the military to make his father proud. Um, he wanted to be a helicopter mechanic. And they said, well, you failed your high school English course, so you're not qualified to be a mechanic, but would you like to be a drone pilot? And he said, sure. And it turned out, because of playing on video games, he was already good at it. He was naturally trained up. And he turned out to be so good that they brought him back from Iraq and made him an instructor in the training academy, even though he's an enlisted man um, and he's still, he was 19, and 
the fascinating thing is you go, that's an interesting story. You tell that story to someone in the Air Force, like an F-15 pilot, and they go, I do not like where this is headed. You know, I've got a college education, the military spent $5 million training me up, and you're telling me that this kid, this 19-year-old, and oh, by the way, he's in the Army, is doing more than I am, and that's the reality of it. ABC News says you wrote the uh, campaign paper for Obama on robots, on— uh, I served as defense policy coordinator for the um, uh, task force there that advised on defense policy, so not just robotics, but uh, across the board. And it was a it was an amazing experience, and one of the things that I was proud of is how we brought together a really diverse set of advisors and experts. You know, people, everything from retired generals to young veterans to academic experts, a whole mix that gather around um, helping to 